Hello everyone and welcome to the next installment of the Elemental Extractions series. Today we're going to be going over beryllium. It is the first of the alkaline earth elements which are all somewhat reactive although less so than the alkali metals which we went over lithium in the previous video. So the thing with beryllium is it's extremely toxic and actually very difficult to get the actual elemental form of the element. So I'm not going to be doing any chemistry in this video. So sorry to disappoint but I, I hope, I've got a few things lined up that I think you'll enjoy that I hope will be uh, instructive and, and interesting to you. The primary ore for beryllium is beryl, and I have several samples of this here. I actually mined this myself uh, just this past weekend at a place called Hog Mine in LaGrange, Georgia, which is a great place to visit if you're into rock hounding, and I'll put a link to that website in the description as well if you'd like to see that. But uh, beryl is sort of a greenish-blue mineral, and uh, aquamarine is actually one of the varieties of beryl. So you can see especially these two pieces on, this, on the left here, uh, they have sort of a bluish cast to them, whereas these are more green. So I think these ones on the left are a little bit sort of aquamarine-y, or at least more so than the other pieces. Uh, and you can see it forms as a hexagon-shaped uh, crystals, which is pretty interesting. So there does exist one thread on the Science Madness forum where there is some beryllium chemistry being done. And I'll put a link to that in the description as well. He starts with beryl and ends up with beryllium hydroxide, which is very interesting in itself, but dealing with beryllium compounds is just not something I'm really prepared to do uh, right now. Plus, he ended up with the hydroxide, and if I do any chemistry, I want to end up with the, the actual element for this series. So to spice this video up a little bit, since I'm not doing a lot of chemistry, um, here's a couple of different minerals that contain beryllium. And these were all from my other hobby of rock hounding. So most of these I collected myself from various mines. Uh, this, this nice big one over here I actually bought, but the rest of them I actually uh, mined myself. So we've got the barrel like I was talking about a minute ago. Uh, this green one is emerald. You can see that it shares the same hexagonal shaped crystals as the barrel does. So this, this one right here is a good hexagon, and then the little green one in there is, is really nice too. And then this one on the right is an awesome sample of uh, aquamarine sort of gemmy type barrel, and that's this little crystal up here. And it's also got some highlight opal and tourmaline. It's a really awesome mineral sample. That one I think deserves a little spotlight, which I'll save till the end of the video. That sample in itself deserves its own little spotlight, so we'll save that to the end of the video. Now one of the properties of beryllium is it's an incredibly lightweight metal. Uh, it's a lot like lithium. Lithium was super uh, lightweight. This one is not quite as uh, light as lithium is, but it's uh, pretty similar. So this is my beryllium sphere, and it feels like nothing. I mean, it, it feels like a, a piece of wood or, or something, or, or maybe it's hollow. It's just so lightweight, it's very strange to actually hold the thing. Um, now I mentioned before that beryllium and, and its compounds are very, very toxic. Um, however, if you have beryllium in this form, where it's a solid piece, uh, it's actually not that bad. It's the dust that you want to watch out for. So you never want to try to machine beryllium, because uh, the dust is extremely bad for you. Uh, but as a solid like this, it's, it's okay to be handled, but I'll still wear my gloves. Now, to demonstrate the extremely low density of beryllium, uh, I wanted to do a couple of experiments to determine the density. Uh, and I think that'll be hopefully instructive if you want to find the density of other things later on. So since my piece of beryllium is a fairly regular shape, uh, first thing I want to try is actually calculating the volume using some formulas. Um, so you can see the beryllium is not quite a sphere. Uh, it's kind of oblong, uh, elliptical almost, and it's got a dent in the bottom, which is going to affect my measurements. But uh, let's assume it's a relatively perfect uh, oblong sphere, and that's called a prolate spheroid. So the way you calculate a volume of such a shape is actually almost exactly the same as for a regular sphere. Uh, it's 4 thirds pi a squared c. And uh, c is the long axis, it's, well it's the long uh, radius of the spheroid and a is the short radius. Uh, so I need to measure the length of both of those axes and then we can do a calculation. So it looks like the long axis is about 1.2 centimeters diameter, so we need to do half of that for the radius. And the short axis is about one centimeter, so that would be a half centimeter radius. So plugging those two numbers into the formula gives us about 0.63 cubic centimeters for the volume of my beryllium. Now to determine the density, we need the weight. And for this video, I get to debut my fancy new digital scale, 
which has a 500 gram capacity and a 0 0.01 gram accuracy, which is pretty sweet. Uh, you, you saw it move a little bit a second ago. It's so sensitive that it's reacting to the uh, air conditioner vent that's blowing sort of on it. <laughs> so maybe I should relocate. But uh, anyways, we should be able to get a really accurate weight for the beryllium. So it's fluctuating a bit between 0.53 and uh, 5.2, just again because of the air currents. So let's just go with 5.3, uh, just to err on the side of caution here. So density, of course, is mass divided by volume. So we got our 1.53 divided by the 0.63 that we measured a minute ago, and we're left with 2.43 grams per cubic centimeter as the density value. That's actually really far off of the theoretical value. And definitely the length measurements were pretty crude. If I had calipers or something, that would be much, much more accurate. So I'm pretty confident in my scales measurement of the weight. So let's try different ways to measure the volume. Uh, first one's called water displacement, uh, which is basically Archimedes principle. When you put something in water, it will make the water rise uh, an amount that's equal to the volume of the object. So I have a graduated cylinder here. I wish I had a smaller one. This is a 50 milliliter, so it may not have quite enough precision to do this, but let's give it a shot. Um, so you see I filled it up to 10 milliliters with distilled water and I'm going to drop the beryllium sphere down into it and we'll see how much the water level actually rises. So let me do this so you can see a little better. There we go. So to me that looks like it went up by about 0.9 milliliters. Again I'm limited by the accuracy of my graduated cylinder but let's see if that gets us any closer. All right, I switched to another piece of paper to keep track of everything. So in theory, it should be 1.85 grams per cubic centimeter. The method one that we tried where we calculated the volume of the sphere, spheroid, uh, we got 2.43, which is quite a bit over. Method two, the one we just did with water displacement, I ended up with 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter, which is uh, too low, so we went too far the other direction. But it's a lot closer to 1.85 than the other one is, so I think we're improving a bit. So let's try a variation on that method. So this next method uses the same principle where the water is displaced by the object, but this time I've filled up a beaker all the way with distilled water, and it's so far, you might be able to see there's a little drop that's kind of almost hanging over the edge of the spout there. So you want to fill it up as much as possible without it actually spilling over. And then when I add the object to it, the water will overflow and spill over into the uh, petri dish there, and I'll be able to collect that and then measure that with my more accurate smaller graduated cylinder, which the object itself won't actually fit in. So let's see if this can give us anything. All right, good. So let's collect that carefully. Move this out of the way. And then I'm going to pipette this stuff up to make sure we get it all. And that will go in here. Okay, so that looks like, if you can see that, it looks like 0.8. Because each of those tick marks is 0.2. So we're at about 0.8 milliliters of water, which is 0.8 grams per, per cubic centimeter. Now plugging that volume into the equation, we end up with 1.91 grams per cubic centimeter, which is uh, again an overshot, but it's even closer than the 1.7. So it, we're kind of bouncing around it, but I think we're starting to zero in on the actual theoretical density. So, so that's pretty cool. So I think it's pretty clear that the source of errors in this experiment is all coming from the volume measurement. I think my digital scale is quite accurate and I trust that pretty well, but these volume measurements are a little bit iffy. Uh, so what if there was a way to measure density without measuring volume at all? Well, it turns out there is, and it's a very, very clever use of the water displacement idea. All right, so this last method uses uh, Archimedes' principle to determine the volume of the object. And Archimedes' principle says that uh, when an object is immersed in a fluid, the fluid will exert an upward force that's equal to the weight of the fluid that is displaced by the object. And that's the buoyant force. Um, so to make use of that, this is a little bit complicated, but uh, hopefully this will make sense by the end. Um, I have a beaker of water and my beryllium sample 
and I made a little little uh, holder uh, out of a piece of um, copper wire. And what we're going to do here is place a, the uh, water on the scale, and the scale will give us the weight of the water, obviously. Um, so we'll tear that. So to get a volume measurement by using a scale, what we need to do is uh, I have my holder here, and I'll put the beryllium in that, and then that will be lowered into the fluid. Now I don't want to touch the sides or the bottom uh, because that would transfer the weight down to the scale. I just want to suspend it in the, in the column, in the water column, not touching anything. And what that's going to do is when it's in the liquid, there's the buoyant force that's pushing up on it uh, that's trying to make it float. And there's also, since the object is not moving, there has to be a downward force uh, equal and opposite to the upward buoyant force. And since we're on a scale, that force will get transmitted to the scale and we'll get a reading from it, which is different than the weight. So this is not actually the weight of the object. What we're measuring here is the weight of the displaced fluid. All right, so let's try this out. You might notice, by the way, that I, I have a little black mark on the wire here. That's all I'm gonna immerse it down to, and that'll become important in a second. So let's see what we do here. like point, point 0.94. My hand is not very steady. I think it was point 0.94 when it was down to the black mark. So that's cool. So that is the weight of the liquid that was displaced um, by the object. And since water has a density of one, that means that is equal to the volume of the object. Um, now, of course, I have to account for the wire that went in there too. So now what I'm going to do is re-immerse it without the beryllium down to the black mark and see what that displaces, and then we'll subtract that from our original value. So like 0.11. Okay, so that is the essentially the volume of the wire, and we subtract that from our, our volume that we got a second ago, and that will give me the volume of the object. Okay, so with this final measurement method, I ended up with, uh, you can see we got the 0.94 was originally, and then I subtracted the 0.11 uh, that was the wire, and I get 0.83 for the volume. And we plug in that in, we get 1.84 grams per cubic centimeter, which, as you might recall, is really, really close to the theoretical value of 1.85. So I'm very pleased with that. So here's the overall results. I'll, I'll post them in the description as well if you'd like to read them down there. I think definitely the benefit of the last method is that it avoids the volume measurement entirely. So you're only relying on your scale, which in my case, I have a very accurate scale. So it works out great to measure both of the quantities that we need to measure. Uh, it also works really well if you don't have a graduated cylinder or if you don't have a very good way to measure volume. So it's a very, very convenient technique that I think not a lot of people know about. So give it a try.